Hi everyone, I'm Anna Rose, the Exhibition and Programming Associate at the Venda. Thanks so much for joining us today for our fourth virtual Art Pass present. It's a monthly series focused on the significance of memory and history in contemporary artwork. Today we're very honored to welcome Miriam Ghani as our guest. She's an artist, writer, and filmmaker. Her work looks at places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible forms and spans multiple disciplines. Her films have screened across the world at festivals, including the Berlinale and Rotterdam, and museums, including the Guggenheim and the National Gallery of DC, among many others. She's received a number of fellowships, awards, grants, and residencies, and some of her recent texts have been published in Eflux, Breeze, Foreign Policy, as well in a number of books. Ghani is known for projects that engage with places, ideas, issues, and institutions over long periods of time, often as part of long-term collaborations. And one of these collaborations is her critical curatorial conservation and creative work with the National Film Archive Afghan Films since 2012. Her first feature-length film, the award-winning and critically acclaimed documentary, What We Left Unfinished, premiered last year. She's currently in production on her second feature, Disease. And in 2020, she had solo collaborative museum exhibitions at the Blaffler Art Museum in Houston and the Speed Art Museum in Louisville. Ghani teaches at Bennington College. This will be about a 45 minute conversation between Farah Yus and Miriam. After that, we'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A, so get your questions ready to put in the Q&A box during that time. We appreciate everyone's questions as always, but we ask that you please keep them short and concise, no longer than a sentence or two. <clears throat> and as we're getting started, feel free to say hi in the chat, um, and you can use the chat for anything that's not necessarily a question. Um, it's always nice to see what city people are tuning in from. I see some of you have already started there. Um, and just a quick reminder to switch the blue button to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your messages, <laughs> not just the panelists. And we'll be posting the recording of today's program on our Vimeo page. So afterwards you can share it, go back and view previous programs um, from our other virtual programming. And we'd like to thank Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and, the, and our virtual programs. And now Yusin Farrell will get us started with the interview. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna Rose. And uh, Mariam, um, uh, you have a very rich uh, body of work, but today we will mainly focus on the two film projects uh, mentioned mm -hmm. by Anna Rose. But before we do so, maybe some more general questions. So one thing that uh, strikes me about your work is that you are addressing the tension between um, if I can say so, official um, histories and counter narratives, personal memories, etc. Mm -hmm. And that made me think uh, we are unfortunately, as you know, <laughs> living in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, political situation now with alternative realities and mm -hmm. contested uh, realities. How do you see uh, the value of counter narratives as opposed to mainstream narratives? Are they both valuable? Are they contradicting or somehow uh, devaluating each other? Mm. Um, what is the role of historical facts in these different interpretations and different versions of history? Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is something certainly that, that I and artists like me have struggled with in recent years as, you know, the whole notion of alternative facts um, sort of took over the, the discussion of, of politics and became such a kind of heated discussion in political discourse. Um, and I think for me, the way I've always described my practice is as a kind of um, speculative historical practice, which is similar to the way that speculative fiction takes a real phenomenon in the present and speculates forward to imagine you know, what might come of it in the future. Um, speculative history sort of takes a real phenomenon in the present and speculates backwards um, to kind of imagine what produced it you know, in the past. And the reason why I sort of started on this kind of speculative historical practice was because, you know, the traces I was finding in the present we're not accounted for in official historical narratives, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was finding this, this kind of trace evidence or this, these, these phenomena in the present that, that just, you know, didn't seem to be 
included in official history and I needed to find a way to account for them. Um, so that's, that's where it came from for me was to try and do it however in, in a kind of responsible way um, is, is the goal to really base it on something observable in the present and in some kind of material trace in um, uh, uh, sometimes an absolutely physical trace um, of, of something that happened in the past that however has not been um, narrativized in the same way that um, a lot of official history has been. And I think this is, this is often a subject position that, that those of us who are you know, not part of, of the dominant group um, find ourselves in, which is trying to locate our history in the marginalia mm -hmm. um, or between the lines um, yeah. of official accounts. And I think what's interesting about you know, the current political discourse is you know, seeing um, members of a dominant group try to occupy that subject position <laughs> and say, you know, but we're, we're the ones who, whose narrative is not being accounted for and has to be located, you know, in these conspiracy theories that are somehow right. between the lines of official accounts. And yeah, it, it's fascinating. It is actually like they're taking over this subject position that people like me have been in for so many decades, right? Yeah, um, but maybe with the not unimportant distinction that mm -hmm. your counter narratives are fact based. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we try to make them fact based, certainly. Yeah. Right. But I think also, you know, for me, the idea of contrapuntal narratives was an important one you know, from the very beginning of my working with narrative, because I come out of a comparative literature background and Edward Said was a very, very important thinker for me. And that's an idea that comes directly out of his writing. This idea that, you know, in border zones and in these kind of center periphery relationships, narratives are always told in contest and counterpoint because there is no single way of, of telling, you know, the story of what happened in a place where you know it's it's a border zone and there are two languages mm -hmm. through which to tell that story or two groups that have been in conflict for their entire history who of course don't have the same narrative of how that happened or you know in the case of both the places that my parents come from where there have been you know decades of civil war and no one agrees on why it happened or how it happened or why it ended or how it ended you know, there, there's no agreement on any of those histories. And so of course, you know, the only way to talk about, you know, those periods is through a kind of contrapuntal narrative that gives space and, and time to all these wildly varying accounts of these, of these histories that, that actually all exist um, at the same time <laughs> um, the, the right now. Yeah. And, and that and that is one of the distinctions between what you do and a, and a mm -hmm. kind of a journalism, right? I mean, yeah. I've heard people recently kind of talk to you about whether your essay films, like the two that we're going to be talking about today, mm -hmm. um, are journalism. And then right. really, clearly they're not, you know, <laughs> no. but, but uh, you know, but it's a more kind of complex distinction than, than just the issue of like, can they be fact checked? And um, how would you kind of characterize that? particular distinction while still valuing journalism. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all do. Value. Yeah, of course, I value journalism enormously. And I, I've, I've collaborated with journalists also through my other project index of the disappeared. Um, I think, you know, with, with what we left and finished in particular, it was never a journalistic project. It was always a project premised on the idea that um, many people are not yet ready to tell a full story of what happened to them or what they did during the um, communist period in Afghanistan. And so whatever accounts I was able to obtain from them would necessarily be partial and possibly partly fictional. Um, and Mar so- Mariam, uh, before yeah. we go into uh, <laughs> yeah. what we left and finished, maybe you mm -hmm. can briefly describe mm -hmm. for people who are not familiar with the film mm -hmm. what you have done there. Yeah, so this is the feature film that I um, that I made that premiered last year uh, at the Berlinale and and is still kind of circulating now, and um, 
it is a film about five unfinished films from the communist period in Afghanistan. And it brings together the um, newly rediscovered and restored footage from those films with the people who in many cases went to really extraordinary lengths to make them. Um, so it's, it's kind of looking at the, um, both the histories and fictions um, embedded in these films um, and the histories and fictions recounted by the people who, who made the films. Mm. Yeah, and kind of juxtaposing those things against each other. Mm. Right. Mm. And uh, do you feel that in all these five unfinished films, mm. five different perspectives about Afghan reality were presented or <laughs> did, do they have a lot in common but mm -hmm. do they, uh, and do they all offer a counter narrative to what we usually hear and read about Afghanistan? Mm. Um, I don't think they are all exactly the same because they were made in different moments um, of, of the Afghan communist period. And um, some of them are actually from distinct, um, uh, distinct regimes actually because there are three different regimes um, that hold sway during the communist period and so the earliest film that I look at um, the April Revolution is actually a reenactment of the Afghan communist coup d'etat of 1978 which most people don't even know happened that there was an Afghan communist coup d'etat before the Soviet invasion like a full year before the Soviet invasion um, so I mean that's that's a completely distinct period the period of Afghan communism before the Soviet invasion um, and then uh, another film that I look at uh, Downfall is really from the mid 80s which is this period of the Soviet puppet regime which is a very paranoid period when um, the state security agency had, uh, had it was reported, um, 20,000 employees, um, half of which were, were off the books informers. Um, and so there was this atmosphere of intense suspicion around surveillance and the film very much reflects that. And then the last three were all made after the Soviet withdrawal. And that's a period of, of kind of opening up in terms of censorship of films and there was more license for filmmakers to do things a little more loosely but also they had much less funding so things became even more DIY than they were already um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why there's more unfinished films from that time right because everyone ran out of money um, and then the regime collapsed so yeah that's that's again, a totally distinct regime, which is this period also of attempted reconciliation between the communists and the Mujahideen under the leadership of um, Najibullah, who was Dr. Najib and then became Najibullah when he wanted to reconcile with the Mujahideen. So, yeah. It was really interesting to hear in that film, you as an artist making, making work about people who, who are artists, who think of themselves definitely as artists, despite the kind of political paradigms within which they had to operate, off, often including censorship. Um, and I, I remember uh, one of them saying, no one can catch a director. Uh, <laughs> when he get, once he gets on set to shoot, he does what he wants. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another, there's a woman, there's an actor uh, who, who says, you know, she knows she's being seen as a non-Muslim and an unbeliever and equivalent to a prostitute, um, et cetera, et cetera. They, they all know the kind of, civic and and political paradigms under which they're operating but they're all really committed mm -hmm. to art making and i wonder what your experience of of their perceptions of themselves as authors um might have been as you went through this mm. yeah i think that's the reason why i was so interested in in this story in the first place and in these people because i i think for me one of the central questions of, of the film is the question of what do you do as an artist under these conditions? What are the choices you end up having to make um, when you know there's something you love like film and something you feel you are driven to make as an artist and something you feel you have to express, messages you wanna get out into the world. And the only way you can do that is to make these kind of, kinds of devil's bargains <laughs> with with a regime that is um, intent on using film as a propaganda tool 
right? And they were very much intent on doing that. Um, so I think the different filmmakers and actors and crew makers that I talked to had crew members, they, they had different positions on this and they, they took different positions at the time and they think about it differently now as well. So some of them, I think were very much believers in, in the project of film as a weapon mm -hmm. um, and film as a political tool. And also, although they don't explicitly say this, I think some of them were very much believers in the communist project. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think others were just going along to get along um, and were just doing whatever they needed to do to get their films made and trying in those films to do whatever they could to slip in whatever they could of their kind of own perspective and their own vision and their, their own sort of little mini documents of what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is a, there is a distinction there between, they, don't, they didn't all make the same choices or take the same paths, but I think for me, that was like the, the main interest in talking to them was seeing like, what are these choices that artists make um, in times of war mm -hmm. under conditions of political repression? Um, and, you know, when faced with extreme censorship, how do they get around it? Mm -hmm. Or when do they bend? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Mariam, as a true historian, in a way, you not only reflect on the sources you found these uh, five unfinished films mm -hmm. in what they, in the stories they tell, but also about the films themselves as material objects mm -hmm. and all the things that happen to these objects, how they land in an archive, how they are uh, forgotten or uh, how you rediscovered them. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, film, these films as objects contribute to uh, giving extra layers of meaning to your story? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you do see in the, in the film in what was left unfinished, you, you see the archive. I mean, the the archive, the Afghan film archive, is one of the main locations of the film, and and we spend quite a lot of time in it. So we see the the films as physical objects in the film, um, and I think that we did that as a reminder of, of of the materiality of these objects and of their vulnerability as material objects. Um, because there was this very long period when all of these directors believed that their films had been lost. Um, and there's a story that one of them tells in the film about um, when he was in exile in the Soviet Union, he heard that all the films of Afghan film had been burned by the Taliban, which in fact turned out not to be the case um, because they had been warned um, by a member of the Taliban, the, the staff who were left, which at that point was only like five or six people. They'd actually been warned by a member of the government, the Taliban government, and they were able to hide almost all of the films and only give duplicate prints to be burned when, when they came to burn the films. They, they were only burning duplicate prints and um, foreign films, you know, which Afghan Films was also responsible for distributing. So they were like, what can, we, what can we afford to lose? Here's what we can mm. afford to lose. Yeah. And they like just put all of that in the courtyard. Um, so I think, you know, 18 plus years when, when these filmmakers thought they would never see these films again. Uh, and so many, they stand in in a way for so many of these objects that people like these filmmakers had to leave behind when they fled during the war. There's so, there's so much that people, people left behind. Like people just left their entire lives behind, you know? Right. So it's houses, land, treasured possessions, other people, <laughs> you know, um, gardens, films. And in the case of these filmmakers, all their scripts, all their notes, like their film reels, like their entire lives work, you know, was all just left behind when they fled, basically. Very few of them got yeah. to keep any of that stuff. That's yeah. why when I asked them what the plots were of these films, none of them remembered because they, they hadn't 
had access to any of this stuff for years and years and years, right? Yeah. 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 It is so fascinating because <laughs> all of these uh, material remnants of history uh, wouldn't be completely lost if, in this case, you were not there to actually um, um, pick them up. Uh, well, I mean, I think as often happens with archives, uh, someone has to ask for it. <laughs> like, some, you know, uh, it does. It, material in archives acquires value even for the archivist it acquires more value if someone is is asking for it and and actively looking for it and so i was i was the first person who came along who was like what happened to the unfinished films um and was just really interested in this idea of there are unfinished films let's try and find those um and no one had actually really tried to look for the unfinished films before um so that was that was what kind of set off the search was this, this curiosity that I had about those films in particular. Um, and so we first found the the rush prints, which hadn't actually been those reels hadn't been opened since, you know, they'd been looked at as dailies like during the shoots and they were just covered in dust. And, you know, that was that was fascinating yeah. to watch those like with people who had been around at the time that they had been shot. Um, and then gradually, eventually tracking down most of the negatives as well. And that way, it's it's a recovery project as well as um, as well as as an artwork. I, I feel like I see that a lot in 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 the art world right now, both from curatorial perspectives and and artists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I look at people like Taos Mahasheva in in uh, in Russia. Dagestan um, or Samuel Mullah, her curatorial work, uh, there will be a contemporary problem framed within a historical recovery project of something local to to the place uh, that they're thinking about. Um, and then when when the show goes uh, kind of public, there's also um, a bibliography, a link, a, a set of links, a kind of an archaeology of artifacts that that is part of the recovery. And mm -hmm. I noticed with what you left unfinished, not only are you recovering these films, finding mm -hmm. them at the archives, but you're also publishing a whole bibliography of references to watch and read and explore mm -hmm. and cheat sheets on Afghan history and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I mean, that's clearly intentional on your part. And <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I mean. So, <laughs> is there a way for you to kind of give us a little perspective mm -hmm. on why why you're doing that right now? Why other people might be doing? I mean, it's kind of a dumb question, but like, I mean, there's 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 a couple of reasons with what we left unfinished. Uh, the cheat sheet we actually made back during the festival run because a lot of press who were you know writing about the film just didn't know anything about the context mm -hmm. um, and the film itself actually doesn't explain very much about the historical context and it did that on purpose mm -hmm. because I didn't want to make a film that primarily existed to explain <laughs> Afghanistan to the west like I just really I just really didn't want to do that <laughs> personally I just didn't want to do it um, and believe me that cost me a, a lot, like in terms of like distribution, funding, lots of things. Um, Cause that's what everyone wanted me to do with that material. They wanted me to make a film that explained Afghanistan to the West. And I just, I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. So instead I made a cheat sheet for the press <laughs> so that they could at least like have some, some like dates and references so they wouldn't get that wrong in the reviews. Um, that was one part of it. And the rest of it I really did for the educational distribution of the film, because it's in educational distribution now. It's going into like university libraries um, and so on. And people are teaching with it. And that was one of my big goals with this film was to, to put it into that kind of distribution and make it something that could be taught. Um, because there's such a dearth of materials to, to teach Afghan history. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I knew that and I know that. Um, and I mean, obviously there's nothing really to teach about Afghan cinema. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's two other films now, um, but neither of them are in educational distribution at the moment. So um, I wanted 
to really make it easy to teach the film. I wanted to, to make it like really, to give all the context that was necessary to teach the film that is not in the film itself, right? Um, so that, that's kind of what's behind that decision for me. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it's similar mm -hmm. um, for some other artists or possibly curators who likewise like do not necessarily want to embed all of the explanation in the art object. Um, it you know? feels like a balance of power yeah. on some level to me that that because kind of pedagogy and art history is so kind of weighted with with Western context that mm -hmm. that uh, you know to show contemporary work from Ghana, uh, you know I'll see a curator showing an earlier mm -hmm. performative social practice from the region and it's and she doesn't yeah. have to then say this is a lesson in Ghanaian art history, but but it's a it's a reframing so that it does yeah. not have to be framed in terms of now. And I feel like mm -hmm. the archive that Yuz has been asking about these objects, mm -hmm. your recovery of them is the frame itself, even without that context that you generously provided. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, part of the part of the context in which I made the work was this much longer term relationship with the archive. Um, which had to do with actually helping them put together a full-scale digitization project of the entire archive. And so, you know, my film was also always intended to be this kind of like wedge mm -hmm. or gateway drug, you know, that's, that's just saying, hey, there's an Afghan cinema. And, you know, the other thing we're doing is restoring, you know, films by the directors I interviewed and at, during when the film premiered at the Berlin Alley, we actually showed three other mm. Afghan films that we had restored. And that also nearly killed me because <laughs> we just finished like restoring and subtitling them um, like four days before the premiere of the film. Uh, it was insane. I, I seriously nearly lost my mind. Um, and that was, you know, we had this entire day of Afghan cinema at the Berlinale, like from 12 to 12, <laughs> it was crazy, you know? It was amazing. It, people stayed for the entire thing also. They, yeah. they stayed through a three hour film about Boskashi, like rival Boskashi dynasties. It's like Romeo and Juliet, but with rival Boskashi dynasties, it has like three full Boskashi matches in it. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they stayed for lots of, I mean, it was, it was, it was incredible. So continuing to do that, continuing to work on restorations, continuing to kind of help the archive when I can, although it's not always an easy relationship. Sometimes it's a very difficult relationship. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's all part of, part of what went into making what we left unfinished. Right. I have the feeling there's so much more to ask and to talk about uh, this film, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I also want to have enough time to speak mm -hmm. about uh, your other current uh, film project, Disease. Uh, so it, you started this project in 2018, mm -hmm. um, funded by the Welcome uh, Trust or the Welcome mm -hmm. Collection, I should say, as a multidisciplinary program commemorating uh, the 1918 pandemic, the Spanish mm -hmm. flu. Yeah. But then uh, all of a sudden COVID-19 hit. And um, well, first of all, can you briefly explain a little bit mm -hmm. about this film project, what it is about, but then mm -hmm. also how the emergence of the new pandemic impacted this project and maybe changed your course for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I hope you can't hear that noise behind me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so the original commission was part of a multi-city project that the Welcome Trust um, put on, uh, started in 2018 at the centenary of the influenza pandemic called Contagious Cities. It happened in uh, New York, Hong Kong, uh, eventually Berlin also, and Geneva um, and London. And there was an artist in residence for each city and I was the New York artist in residence. Um, so what we were asked to do as artists in residence was, was a very broad brief. It was just make something about contagion and cities and virality and migration. It was like really broad. I was like, and then 
I was like, in any form? Yes, in any form, um, which is amazingly generous. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I had not previously really made any work about public health or disease or epidemiology touching on any of those subjects. I had made a lot of work about migration um, and immigration and you know questions around borders. Uh, and language. So I said, let me approach this from something that I know, which is language. Um, and let me go back to an essay that I read a long time ago and loved, which is Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor. Uh, and I decided to kind of look at you know, how the language we use to talk about disease affects how we treat people who are sick. Uh, and that was sort of the starting point of, of my project. And I thought I'll make a little short film about this. Um, and it turned out to be a really enormous subject, like just gigantic. Um, and also epidemiology was fascinating uh, because it touches on absolutely everything. Um, and it's a really, really, really interesting lens through which to look at structural inequity, which I actually had not totally expected before I really started delving into it. But I. I quickly realized, okay, you know, when we start talking about public health, we're talking actually about structural inequity is what we're really talking about. Um, we're talking about how health intersects with race. We're talking about how health intersects with class. We're talking about how health intersects with um, public policy. Um, and we're also talking about how it intersects with um, immigration policy. And it was just, it's so much. Um, and then language actually plays an enormous role in all of these things. Um, and not just verbal language, but also visual language and the way that we actually develop this kind of imaginary around disease became so interesting to me. And so I started really delving into, in particular, what I started to think about is this kind of master metaphor of the war on disease, um, it, because it was so all pervasive. It was in all the language, in every aspect of everything that I was looking at. And it was also in so much of the imagery. It was in all of these PSA films. It was in all of these allegorical images, like engravings and caricatures and so on, going so far back. And I was like, this has been around for a really long time. It crosses a bunch of languages. Um, it exists in a lot of different countries. Why, why, why is this so pervasive? And what does it do in the world? You know, were my questions. So I wanted to find out where it came from historically, um, how it spread so far and why, and then what it's doing right now. Um, and it turned out that what it was doing right now in 2018 was really powering this kind of shift of responsibility for pandemic preparedness from public health agencies to national security agencies. <laughs> and I found that super troubling. I was like, why, why, why are we leaving pandemic preparedness to our, to like Homeland Security, that doesn't make any sense. Um, why, why did we just take away the responsibility for, for pandemic preparedness from like the CDC and the, and the NIH? And the, it's just, it just seemed very odd to me. So I thought there's a bigger film here. There's a much bigger film here. And I decided to keep developing it into a feature. Uh, and that's what I was working on when COVID-19 started. <laughs> I had amassed this massive Zotero database. I don't know if anyone in the audience uses Zotero, but it's this amazing open source digital humanities software. I had like a 770 item Zotero database all about pandemics and epidemics um, and metaphors and illness and isolation and contagion. And then, you know, I found myself in New York at the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak mm -hmm. <laughs> in isolation in New York in the middle of a, an outbreak. And it felt really unsurprising um, because I had al already become super paranoid about the, the prospect of another um, pandemic happening. Um, I just was expecting it to be influenza. Um, I think almost everyone was expecting it to be influenza. And a coronavirus was a surprise. Uh, 
um, but a pandemic was not a surprise. Um, and then the disastrous way that it was handled was also not a surprise, but it was worse, much, much worse than I had anticipated. Um, but I just saw everything that I had been writing about and thinking about and looking at just un unfolding in real time. And it was, it was really eerie. Um, like every, like Macron, Trump, even the head of the WHO, like going on television and declaring war on COVID-19. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, that, that just was constantly happening, right? Yeah. We're talking about it the, as the invisible enemy, right? Um, yeah. Right. I mean, one of the, one of the ways in which you talk about um, this kind of national security paradigm is in terms of borders, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the kind of origination in Imperial Germany uh, mm -hmm. in the late 19th century of yeah. you know, military expansion, solidifying concept, uh, concept of nations and the emergence of germ theory all at once. Mm -hmm. And yeah. suddenly you say there are caricatures of germs immediately used to depict aliens crossing borders. Yeah. I mean, and we see that now, right? So so how how in that kind of a context in, in your research mm -hmm. have you seen it a possibility for the to prevent the fear of the other, even as we even as we kind of mm -hmm. actually do have to think about borders between houses, between states, between mm -hmm. nation states. Yeah. Well I mean what's interesting is a lot of the way we think about disease in um, the cultural imaginary, a lot of the way it's depicted and a lot of the way we, we talk about it, um, the whole pop cultural imaginary of disease basically is based on a what is now an outdated scientific paradigm because science has moved on from germ theory as it was conceived in the late 19th century. That's not how science talks about germs anymore, right? That's not how science thinks about or talks about disease. Um, but that's still how we talk about it in cultural discourse. Um, and I think that's where something interesting actually could be done mm -hmm. is in, you know, trying to find a way to translate the current, you know, state of scientific discourse into cultural mm -hmm discourse into the cultural imaginary, finding a way to actually bring the cultural discourse up to date with the scientific discourse. Because the way scientists think about it, germs aren't coming to us, we are going to them. Mm. You know? That's what's actually happening. Mm. Right? It's not like they're coming for us like some inexhaustible army. We are constantly going to them. This is what's happening. We are trespassing into territories that were formerly exclusively the province of wild animals, wild flora and wild fauna, and we are going into those territories and industrializing them. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that's when new diseases spill over. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they're coming for us, we are going to them, this is what's happening. Um, that's, how, that's, that's how all the most recent epidemic scale outbreaks have happened. So yeah. maybe we humans are the real firm in, in that story. I mean, if you look at the world on a viral scale, it looks really different, honestly. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. I wanted to ask you, though, because uh, these metaphors has been uh, used so vehemently mm -hmm. since the late 19th mm -hmm. century, especially mm -hmm. uh, uh, also with political aims, uh, of course, mm -hmm. there, where the Jews being called the uh, vermin yeah. uh, by the National Socialists that yeah. already had its uh, prehistory uh, going back to the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But also you find the same metaphor used by uh, officials under Stalin to uh, address uh, bourgeois decadent elements mm -hmm. and modern artists. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the same, uh, by the way, among American, conserv mostly conservative um, mm -hmm. politicians who again described uh, abstract expressionist artists for instance as uh, contamination of uh, the american society mm -hmm. and it never stops uh, yeah. only recently sean hannity uh, countered um, uh, um, a piece by kara swisher uh, which was about the ineffective um, dealings with the trump uh, of, by the trump administration of the COVID pandemic and calling her a pest. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit why this um, 
why you think this tradition is so pertinent and uh, why people keep using it? Mm. Well, I think there has for a very long time been a kind of conflation between fighting diseases and fighting the people who have them, I mean, fighting diseases and their carriers, right? And, you know, that's been happening for hundreds of years. <laughs> so, um, and then that extends into, you know, the other thing that happens is we, we, we make metaphors out of the diseases themselves, right? The diseases become metaphors to describe other things. And I think the, the best example of this is probably cancer. Cancer has become metaphorized so extensively um, and it's used so often, especially to talk about cities, right? And the way that um, undesirable parts of cities are cancerous, right? Um, and should be, should be removed like cancers, I think. Um, so I think there's a way in which mm, anything alien, anything unwanted, anything other, it's easy to label it as diseased, right? That's a very easy way to say, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> we don't want you because, you know, we can, we can just shuffle you out because you're diseased. It's like the, you can be quarantined, you can be excluded, you can be isolated, you can be cleansed, you can be, you know, um, we can heal ourselves by removing you. Um, and it's a very powerful metaphor for that reason, because just by labeling someone as diseased, you can say, it's okay to remove you. Right? Yeah. And it also, mm -hmm. of course, has the implication of being contagious and spreading mm -hmm. invisibly. Exactly. And controllable. Yeah. yeah. But I think this is, this is one of the reasons why we really do need to think about developing new language to talk about disease because again like most of the diseases that we we now live with we're going to live with forever you know um even diseases that in the 20th century were believed to be eradicated are all resurgent now because of climate change cholera for example malaria you know great triumph of the who eradicating malaria the, that was never eradicated right um except in some nice white parts of the West. Um, you know, it's, we really do need to think about a paradigm of coexistence <laughs> with diseases because that's what we're actually living through, right? Um, and this is one of my questions is like, what would public health look like if we reframed it instead of public health being framed as like this constant battle and struggle and fight and desperate, desperate, attempt to just get rid of things if we were actually framing it around you know a paradigm of coexistence a, a question of like how do we live with diseases and with each other and with other species what would that look like right how would that actually change the discussions um because you know that's the only way any of us are going to survive is if we all learn to live together including with our diseases i'm you know, because that that's that is the reality of what's happening. Absolutely, I I, I think uh, we should go to the Q and A. It's a mm. quarter to uh, one. Vera, do you want to start picking a mm. question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, David Adik asks a, a kind of a question that that takes off a little bit on what you've just described. So mm -hmm. I'll ask: Is do you have plans to to create a film about how? human destruction of habitat or expansion into habitat is facilitating pandemic disease and environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. So much of the current narrative is about the threat of global, global warming, yet the solution to global warming is solar and wind, which will further expand the human footprint. All right. So, I mean, because you've been talking about how we go to disease. Yeah. So clearly in this relational paradigm you're, you're, you're setting up, um, uh, you know, it's very much tied to climate change. So is that even a different film? Um, uh, no, it actually is part of this film, and I think the question around human expansion of habitat is is an enormous part of the conversation around um, uh, epidemic and pandemic disease. And one of the interesting things that has happened during COVID is that that 
conversation has actually surfaced into public discourse in a way that it really hadn't before. Mm -hmm. um, the whole the whole idea of the intersection of pandemics and climate change is mm -hmm. is actually something that people are aware of on a much much broader scale now than they were when I was originally researching this film when it was kind of thought of as like a fringe discourse, right? Mm -hmm. um, that only like some epidemiologist and some climate change activists were like yelling about in the corner, mm -hmm. um, and now it's like really a, a, a kind of a mainstream conversation, which is one interesting effect of the COVID nineteen pandemic. But yes, that actually is part of this film, um, the question around uh, human habitat expansion and its role in pandemics. Um, Another yeah. question is by Bruce Hollihan. Mm -hmm. He writes, what were the positive aspects of the SOAR revolution, the revolution <laughs> of 1978, and the subsequent Dem Democratic Republic of Afghanistan? Mm. How did these realities impact the lives of artists and did others benefit? What about mm. women's rights? Right. Okay, yeah, so that's a complicated question because, um, of course, some people did benefit from, from the uh, um, communist revolution um, of 1978, and women were among the people who benefited the most in the cities that were controlled by the communist regime, but you also have to remember that it was basically only ever the cities that were controlled by the communist regime. Um, and only ever some people um, who benefited from the reforms enacted by the communist regimes. So, you know, while I have, for example, talked to like one of the founders of the Afghan Women's Progressive Union, who became the head of a major hospital um, in, uh, in Kabul in the 80s, which is certainly something that would not have happened um, under the it probably wouldn't have happened under the monarchy in the 60s, although that's when she went to medical school. It might have happened under Dawood in the 70s, actually, quite frankly. There, I don't think there would have been anything stopping her under Dawood in the 70s from doing that. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there is a kind of lively debate around who benefited and how. Um, artists, certainly benefited enormously. And that's one reason why all the you know filmmakers in my film are extremely nostalgic for that time because, and the actors as well, because they were given a position in society um, that they have never had, they never had before and they, they certainly haven't had since. Um, they were elevated in a way that was totally anomalous in, in Afghan history. <laughs> um, you know, that that probably hadn't been seen since like Firdasi was the court poet in uh, in Ghazni, and even Firdasi like fell out with Sultan Mahmud, right? Um, and ended up like what what did he end? he ended up the the dedication I think of the Shahnameh May is like really really rude to, to to Sultan Mahmud. It's like really nasty. Anyway, something like that. So yeah, there's not a great history of like artists and government support in Afghanistan. And that's the only period when it was really happening. Um, so artists certainly are nostalgic for that. There were artist unions, the heads of the unions had diplomatic passports, so on and so forth. But, you know, all of this came at an enormous cost. Um, there was, if you put one foot over the line, you know, you would be arrested. And some of the directors I talked to, like, one of them was arrested multiple times in the 80s, even though he was the most popular filmmaker in Afghanistan and still is, right? Yeah, he was in jail multiple times. At one point he was, I didn't put this story in my film, but at one point he actually was flown to Moscow to have his film developed by the KGB um, because another filmmaker had reported maliciously that um, he had been filming Soviet troop movements during like the shoot for his, his latest film. Right. Um, so they took him and all his negatives to, uh, to Moscow and developed it like under the eye of the KGB and not until every frame of film was scrutinized was he allowed to go back to Afghanistan. Otherwise he would have like been thrown into prison in, in Moscow. Um, and people were, people who were arrested often never came back. You know, I have I have a great uncle who was assassinated. I mean, I have a great uncle who was executed in 78. I have great uncles who were tortured. <laughs> I have, you know, a lot of people who were in my family were in prison in the 80s. So my grandfather was in prison for 10 years. 
So, you know, I don't have a super rosy view of the communists personally. No. Like, I mean, yeah. 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 By the way, as it is a little bit quiet now in the Q&A, yeah, let me ask you one follow-up <laughs> question about uh, the revolution and yeah. specifically about the first of the five films um, mm -hmm. you yeah. uh, mentioned in your um, film in the month of Soar, mm -hmm. um, which interestingly, and this is all about history and representation, mm -hmm. was made as a feature film, but then later described by the director as a documentary. Yes, that's Can true. Can you tell us how <laughs> that could happen and what it tells us about history and representation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's an amazing story um, of this film, The April Revolution, which you know was shot three months after the actual April Revolution, um, the Soar coup of 1978, and features the entire army and air force repeating much of what they did on the day of the revolution, including using actual missiles and actual bullets. And, you know, it's, it's quite a spectacle. Um, and uh, it did also originally include extensive scenes of Hafizullah Amin um, with his family reenacting what they did on the day of the coup because Amin famously gave the order for the coup from his house arrest at his house um, uh, on, on that day because the thing that triggered the coup was all of the leaders of the Communist Party being arrested. Um, except Amin, who was put under house arrest because he had a cousin in the mi Ministry of the Interior. So, so they went they went easy on him, which was a mistake, obviously, um, historically. But um, mm, I could only retrieve uh, three and a half minutes of that footage because the rest of it all disappeared. Um, it was confiscated, um, confiscated. It was taken by, by the... Um, uh, Uzbek filmmaker Malik Kayumov, um, while he was making um, his documentary about the Afghan revolution, um, Afghanistan, the revolution continues in 1980, which came out in 1980. He took the footage in 1979. He took it back to Uzbekistan. Presumably it was at Uzbek film um, when Uzbek film was dissolved in the 90s and nobody knows what happened to anything that was at Uzbek film when it dissolved in the 90s. Every now and then something turns up in someone's basement. Um, but otherwise, who knows? Who knows what happened to those reels? So all I was able to retrieve were the three and a half minutes that were actually in Kayumov's final film. Um, and those I had to buy back from Krasnogorsk because <laughs> they wouldn't give them to me. <laughs> they wouldn't give them to Afghan Film, um, which wrote an official letter, even though Afghan Film is credited as a co-producer of Kayumov's film. Um, they were like, nope, you gotta you got buy it. You gotta buy it. So I bought it and gave it back to Afghan Film. But um, I could only afford it in HD, not 4K, sorry. <laughs> like, it's, like, <laughs> it's really expensive. Um, so I got off track a little bit there, but um, the what happened with that film was that because the footage um, of the, the coup reenactment started being recycled in all these other films later, including by its own director, um, who recycled it in the film Escape um, in the 80s, um, by Kayumov, who used it in his documentary, by other people who made films about the Afghan revolution, that it, it really started to become accepted as this record of the coup, because of course there was no actual record of the coup. So this became the kind of stand-in mm -hmm. for a documentary of the coup d'etat. And at a certain point, even its director started to refer to it as the documentary about the coup d'etat, <laughs> although he knows perfectly well. I mean, this is not, it's actually the cinematographer, not the director, the director is dead. Um, but he knows perfectly well it wasn't a documentary. He was there, he shot it, um, but, I think everyone got in the habit of thinking about it as a document rather than a fiction because it's very close to being a document in a strange way and also it had real effects. Um, so there's another story that I didn't get to put into the film which is kind of extraordinary which is about Hafez al-Amin and the April Revolution film which is um, that because they, they had to put the flag of the monarchy or you know, the flag of Dawood's Republic back up over the, um, the presidential palace um, for the purposes of shooting this film, 
mm -hmm. had to put it back up temporarily. Some people thought that the communist government had actually fallen because it had only been three months since the coup, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that stable yet. Mm -hmm. So some people actually thought, oh my God, the communist government has fallen. Um, and some of these party loyalists who weren't that loyal um, sort of panicked and they were Chalkis. They were part of the Chalk wing of the party and Chalkis were known for their luxuriant mustaches. Okay. Um, and um, these guys shaved their mustaches and Amin heard about it later. He had them all arrested and no one ever heard from them again. So that's what happened when they raised the flag for this film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of moments like that in the film where people mm -hmm. were shooting with Kalashnikovs during a scene. And then when they put their guns down, real people with Kalashnikovs mm -hmm. would shoot at them or, yeah. um, or a, a screenwriter, you know, who actually worked for the intelligence service would yeah. have been uh, documentary elements. And it seemed to me like, the issue really was that three month type period, that kind of contemporaneity with with what was being depicted. Yeah. And um, right. Yeah, I think so, some of it's that I think also, you know, no one no one I interviewed would really admit this, but I think, you know, they in a way they did become except Yasemin. Yasemin talks about this, but I think they did um, become genuine targets mm -hmm. or opponents of the regime because they were the faces of of the of the regime the mm -hmm. actors in particular became really heavy heavily targeted mm -hmm. because they were the faces of the regime directors also eventually became targeted the shoots i think were deliberately targeted they always say we and then we ended up in the middle of a firefight like it was an accident but i i don't think it was accidental at all i think they were being deliberately targeted because the opponents of the regime understood just as well as the regime did that the films were part of, you know, this this fight for the hearts and minds of Afghans, right? They were they were part of this propaganda struggle. And Masood, in particular, um, one of the most famous Mujahideen commanders, also had a film unit. Mm -hmm. um, and several people from Afghan films eventually defected and joined his film unit, like Sadiq Barmak famously joined his film unit. Also. Um, uh, Nur Hashem Abir, who you see in um, uh, The Black Diamond, one of my, the unfinished films um, that I used, he's, he also shot one of the other ones, but he, he's, um, he's, he's the guy who's sort of combing his hair in the mirror in The Black mm -hmm. Diamond. He defected and joined Mas uh, Masood's film unit, and he is credited as the director of the, the film Ascension, which is the only film finished during the civil war period in the 90s, which was financed entirely by Masood and like basically is like follows the life of a Mujahid and it has all of Masood's actual fighters and is shot like partly in his camp and like has all of his like tanks and guns and anti-tank missiles and everything in it. It's like, so it's the opposite side of this coin, you know, in the same way that these regime sponsored filmmakers had access to all the government helicopters and you know, ex spies to play spies and, you know, all of that kind of side of things being a little too real. Maybe the Mujahideen side actually also were, were using the same playbook um, as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's one o'clock, but uh, <laughs> let's um, uh, finish with the last question uh, mm -hmm. from David Eric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, he writes, as the Taliban becomes e increasingly ascendant, mm -hmm. is there enough cohesive mass to carry Afghan art and culture forward from mm -hmm. abroad or at home? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I mean, there, there certainly is a, a critical mass of, of Afghan uh, cultural workers, I would say. There's a, a lot of the younger generation making things. Um, in Afghanistan, but certainly there were also a lot of people making things when the Taliban first came <laughs> into power. So it depends very much on what kind of deal is struck with the Taliban during you know, these peace negotiations um, and how much power is given to them um, and what kind of concessions are made. Um, 
and I, I can't I can't predict that I and I, I have no idea of what will come of these negotiations and what kind of concessions will be made and then also whether the Taliban will adhere to any kind of deal that is made is the, is the next question that no one can answer so you know I think there are many very interesting filmmakers um, both in Afghanistan and in the diaspora who have strong voices um, and I think they will they will definitely do their best to continue making things in the same way that you know the filmmakers I interviewed did during the communist period. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. Right. So Mariam, I want to <laughs> thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. <laughs> it's uh, very special to have you. Thank you thank both. You. Yeah, it was nice yeah. to see you again. <laughs> yeah. I think. So um, our program for next week, uh, we will resume the Cold War Spaces uh, interview series, this time with Dutch historian Jon Verriet in a Thanksgiving-inspired conversation about Cold War food history under the title <laughs> Culinary Space, Debates and Practices. Mm. Hope to see you then. Have a wonderful week.